Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from Antiwar.com. This is Antiwar News for Wednesday, July 31st, 2024. All right, so some real big news broke when I finished recording the show. So I'm just adding this in the front here. Uh, Iran says Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh was assassinated in Tehran. And Hamas has also put out a statement confirming that he was killed. So this is big because Israel has a history of carrying out assassinations inside Iran. So they are obviously uh, the main suspect here. Um, And that is what uh, the statement from Hamas called it a treacherous Zionist raid. So obviously they're blaming Israel. Um, so this is big. And what I cover in the rest of the show, uh, Israel launched a big airstrike in Beirut targeting a Hezbollah commander. Um, not clear if that commander was killed, but this is another big escalation here uh, from Israel. And, you know, there's a chance of things really exploding in the region. So I just wanted to mention that up front. Details are not really clear. Apparently, he was at a home in Tehran in the Iranian capital where he was killed. Um, So we will see how everybody responds to this. All right. So here's the rest of the show. And again, I was unaware of this assassination when I recorded this. So uh, enjoy. All right, the first story at the top of antiwar.com today. Israel bombs Beirut. Three civilians reported killed. So an Israeli airstrike targeted the southern suburbs of the Lebanese capital of Beirut on Tuesday, a step that could escalate the Israel-Hezbollah conflict into a full-blown war. Israel uh, is claiming that it targeted a senior Hezbollah commander, Fuad Shukr, Uh, A Lebanese government official told CNN that Shukr survived the strike while Israel is claiming that he was killed. Lebanon's health ministry is reporting that three civilians, including two children, were killed in the attack and 74 others have been wounded. Um, So you see some of the damage here at the street level. It's a pretty big strike in a residential area uh, of Beirut. The Israeli military claimed that Shukr was responsible for the rocket that killed 12 Druze children in the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights on Saturday. Hezbollah has denied responsibility for the killing of these children and has said that they were hit by an Israeli air defense rocket. So after the strike, after Israel bombs Beirut, the U.S. expressed strong support for Israel against Hezbollah. Uh, National Security Council spokeswoman Adrian Watson said, quote, Our commitment to Israel's security is ironclad and unwavering against all Iran-backed threats, including Lebanese Hezbollah, end quote. So Hezbollah has warned that if Israel launched a strike in Beirut or deep inside Lebanese territory, then it would mean all, ru- all rules of war are off, basically saying um, that they will, you know, really escalate their attacks on Israel. So far, haven't seen a response. I'm recording this before midnight on Tuesday night. Um, have Hezbollah, as far as I've seen, has stayed quiet on this. They haven't really put out any statements yet. So we'll see uh, if they hit back hard in response to this. Um, and the last time that Israel bombed Beirut was on January 2nd when the Israeli military launched a drone strike that targeted a senior Hamas official. If you remember that, they they killed a Hamas official who was involved in the hostage deal negotiations. And that was the first time Israel bombed Beirut since 2006. Um, So before this happened, you know, there's been all these reports I haven't really covered. I think I might have mentioned them. Um, All these reports saying that the U.S. was warning Israel not to target Beirut, telling Israel don't do it. Um, but they're not putting any, obviously didn't put any real pressure on Israel because they're, they're still giving them military aid and they are backing them in this, essentially saying that if this turns into a full-blown conflict, you know, we're going to back Israel. Um, so there is that. 
And then the next story here, so this happens in Beirut, um, and then just a couple hours later, the U.S. launches airstrikes in Iraq, and four PMF fighters have been reported killed. So not many details about this yet. Again, this came out kind of late Tuesday. A U.S. official told Reuters that the U.S. carried out a strike in Iraq on Tuesday, just hours after Israel bombed Beirut. The official did not share details about the attack, but earlier in the day, uh, a drone strike was reported in the Iraqi province of Babylon that hit a base housing Iraq's popular mobilization forces, the PMF, a coalition of mostly Shia militias that's part of Iraq's security forces. A PMF official told AFP that the base was hit by four or five missiles. An Iraqi security source confirmed that four people were killed and said the death toll was expected to rise. And the U.S. had, so we didn't see the U.S. say directly that this was the strike they were responsible for. Again, very little detail about this, but this seems to be the U.S. bomb, the PMF base. Um, and the U.S. has a history of targeting the PMF as retaliation for rocket attacks on U.S. bases. In the region, the U.S.'s latest attack, you know, so this bombing came a few days after rockets were fired toward the Ain al-Assad Air Base in western Iraq, which I covered, um, I believe, in the Friday show. And then uh, the day after that, uh, a U.S. base in Syria uh, came under rocket attack. Um, so from October 2023 until February, U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria came under hundreds of rocket and drone attacks, and Iraqi Shia militias, which include members of, of the PMF under that coalition, they began the attacks in response to U.S. support for the Israeli onslaught in Gaza. After three U.S. troops were killed in an attack on Tower 22, a secretive base in Jordan on the Syrian border, Iran and the Iraqi government pressured the militias to stop, and there have only been a handful of attacks since February. The Iraqi government strongly opposes unilateral U.S. strikes on the PMF since the coalition is part of its military, and the U.S. never coordinates these attacks with Baghdad. Um... I mean, it just goes to show what a mess the whole situation is. The U.S. needs to just be out of Iraq. That's clearly the solution here. Um, U.S. attacks on the PMF led to Iraqi Prime Minister Mohammed Shia al-Sudani calling for a U.S. withdrawal. There's been no real concrete progress toward that withdrawal, which is probably why there were, were those rocket attacks last week. Um, so uh, I think, you know, there's a chance that if Hezbollah wants to hit back really hard against Israel, they might coordinate it with the Iraqi militias with, you know, in Iraq and Syria, um, either for them to also, you know, fire drones or something at Israel, or maybe since they know the U.S. is going to back Israel, um, maybe they would want them to launch a big attack on U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria. I think that's a possibility. I don't think Iran uh, would necessarily want that. Um, you know, a big attack on, on U.S. bases like that because that could lead to them being attacked. Um, but we'll see. I mean, I think uh, I, I think the Hezbollah's silence today I think is kind of concerning. It means that they might be planning something big. Um, and the U.S. is obviously going to be, you know, right in the middle of it. You, you know, this could lead to more U.S. troops being killed. Um, it's just a whole mess. And the U.S. is just... You know, I mean, you look at the timing of this. If I have the timing right, it was 8 o'clock in Beirut when the Israeli strike hit, and then they're saying 9.30 at night when the strike hit Iraq. I mean, so just, you know, shortly after. I think they're the same time zone, Beirut, and, and this area of Iraq. I'm not positive, though. But either way, just a couple hours after. All right, so the next one here, Israeli strikes on crucial Yemen port caused $20 million in damage. This article is from Kyle Anzalone at the Libertarian Institute. So the Israeli airstrike that recently hit a fuel depot at the Yemeni port of Hodeida has resulted in tens of millions of dollars in damages to the important facility. Hodeida is a crucial point of entry for food and other goods reaching the Yemeni people. So a port official uh, told AFP that the damage... Uh, is estimated to be at $20 million. There was damage to the dock. Two cranes were destroyed. A small vessel was burnt, and a number of buildings were scorched. There were huge fires. They were battling the fires, I believe, for a couple days. 
Um, and this port official said the total would be higher once the oil ministry announced the damage to the oil infrastructure that was targeted by Israel. So this is just the port damage. Um, so uh, these were big strikes that Israel launched on July 21st, and that was in response to the drone attack on Tel Aviv that killed one Israeli. Um, and the Houthis have said, you know, that they're going to respond in a big way. They said it was... Uh, you know, they were happy to be in a direct confrontation with Israel. Haven't seen anything major from, from the Houthis since then, uh, but that's a possibility. I mean, if they want to coordinate something with Hezbollah, the Houthis are much more of their own, you know, um, you know, they kind of do their own thing much more than Hezbollah and then the, the Shia militias in Iraq and Syria, but certainly possible that they could coordinate with Hezbollah if, if they want to do something big. Um, and the U.S. has been bombing Yemen. Uh, they announced, you know, several times, multiple times in the past week, something I really need to cover more. There's just such a little detail about it. It's basically the U.S. puts out a press release. Sometimes Yemeni media uh, covers the strikes, but not always. Um, but they, the U.S. Central Command just announced an airstrike on, on Tuesday, so the U.S. continues to bomb Yemen. All right, so the next one here, the U.S. will not call rape of Palestinians a war crime. So the State Department on Tuesday refused to label Israeli soldiers raping Palestinian prisoners as a war crime. So Saeed Arakat, who is a reporter for Al-Quds, if you ever watch the State Department press briefings, he's always asking good questions um, and just making the State Department spokespeople just look like complete ghouls. Um, but he asked State Department spokesman Vedant Patel about the Israeli soldiers who were detained for raping a Palestinian prisoner at the notorious Sedi Taiman detention facility. The Palestinian was transferred to a hospital with damage to his rectum that was so severe he could not walk. The condition of the prisoner confirms some of the worst allegations about the conditions in this Israeli uh, detention facility. Both Israeli whistleblowers and former Palestinian prisoners have detailed torture and widespread abuse carried out by Israeli soldiers at the facility. So Arkot asked Patel, he said, quote, apparently rape and killings and torture and all this thing, it happens regularly in Israeli detention camps. Does that constitute a war crime to you? End quote. Patel replied, quote, so the reports of abuse are deeply concerning, and we have been clear and consistent with Israel and the IDF that they need to treat all detainees humanely and with dignity in accordance with humanitarian law, end quote. He added that the U.S. was going to let due process play out in the case against the Israeli soldiers. So Arakat followed up. He said, quote, now, if proven to be true, that does constitute a war crime, doesn't it? End quote. And Patel said... Quote, I am not a legal expert, Saeed. Certainly, I imagine it would be inconsistent with Israeli law, end quote. So, you know, he can't even just strongly condemn what, what has happened here. This is all very wishy-washy language saying, oh, you know, we're concerned about what we're hearing here. This sounds all really bad. And again, this isn't just this one case. This is... Israeli whistleblower, you know, we have known for a while of the horrific conditions in this prison. And now here we have confirmation again of just the worst torture uh, allegations are, are, are true. Um, and he's, <laughs> is it a war crime? And he says, I'm not a legal expert. So look back at what U.S. officials say about other uh, countries. Um, in contrast, the U.S. government was quick to label Russia's actions in Ukraine as war crimes. And President Biden even declared as early as March 2022, which was less than one month into Russia's invasion of Ukraine, that Vladimir Putin was a war criminal. Um, this is something the U.S. president said. And in the face of all of this evidence of, you know, some of the worst torture imaginable, they uh, are saying, ah, you know what, let's not get, get ahead of ourselves here, you know before we start uh, calling this a crime. I mean, it's completely absurd. <clears throat> and this was, of course, the story that I covered yesterday with the, the these Israeli soldiers suspected of this were arrested and Israeli 
activists, you know, considered far right and including members of the Israeli Knesset and even one member of the government, the heritage minister, joined in on these protests and stormed this facility. And then they stormed another military base. That was their response. All right, so the next one here, lice, scabies, rashes, plague Palestinian children. So this is from AP News, um, the Associated Press. A steady stream of miserable children and worried parents flowed into the dermatology office at Nasser Hospital in central Gaza. A toddler with a blue hair bow sobbed as her mother showed how the red and white spots covering her face have spread to her neck and chest. Another woman lifted her little boy's clothes to reveal the rashes on his back, butt, thighs, and stomach. On his wrists, he had open sores from scratching. A father stood uh, his daughter on the desk so the doctor could examine the, the legions on her calves. Skin diseases are running rampant in Gaza, health officials say. The cause, they say, is the appalling conditions in overcrowded tent housing camps, Tent camps housing hundreds of thousands of Palestinians driven from their homes, along with the summer heat and the collapse of sanitation that has left pools of open sewage amid 10 months of Israel's bombardment in the territory. Doctors are wrestling with more than 103,000 cases of lice and scabies and 65,000 cases of skin rashes, according to the World Health Organization. In Gaza's population of some 2.3 million, more than 1 million cases of acute respiratory infections have been recorded since the war began, along with more than half a million of acute of acute diarrhea and more than 100,000 cases of jaundice, according to the UN's development program. So just to completely horrific situation. Cleans- cleanliness is impossible in the ramshackle tents, Basically, wood frames hung with blankets or plastic sheets crammed side by side over wide stretches. Um, so the, there's the, a video here and you see some of these the, the skin diseases that these kids are dealing with. Um, all right, so the next story here. Images of starving Palestinian boy went viral and the attention saved him. Um, So this is an article from the Washington Post, and this is uh, good news. If you see this picture of this Palestinian child, uh, Fadi Al-Zant, and I remember seeing pictures of him. In my memory, I thought um, they said that he died, uh, but maybe I I had that wrong in my head. Um, But he, this is what he looks like now. He looks like a normal little boy, completely, looks completely healthy. And he was evacuated out of Gaza. He actually ended up in the United States. According to the pictures from this Washington Post article, he's actually on Long Island, um, which is where I'm from. So I'm happy that he's finding some relief there. And uh, um, he uh, just, you know, some of the most, one of the most horrific pictures coming out of Gaza were of him in the hospital. So it's good to see. So the the pictures of him went viral and it got uh, attention and then there's a Palestinian organization there's an organization that's been helping evacuate children from Gaza which of course their job has become a lot harder since the Rafa border crossing was closed the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund um, they raise money to get people out of to get these kids out of Gaza and, and they, they have a lot of pictures in here you kind of see his slow recovery um, he has cystic fibrosis and was not able to get the, the medication needed and uh, couldn't get the, the nutrient food that he needed. So he really became skin and bones. And uh, thankfully, he, he, he survived and, and he's doing good now. So the next story here, Palestinians return to rubble in Khan Yunus. Thousands of Palestinians returned to areas of the southern Gaza city of Khan Yunus on Tuesday after Israeli forces withdrew from the city and left it in ruins. Israel launched a new assault on eastern Khan Yunus on July 22nd, marking at least the third time the Israeli military invaded the city. Gaza's civil defense agency said about 300 bodies have been found in the area since the Israeli attack started. Um, Civil defense spokesman Mahmoud Basel told AFP, quote, Since the beginning of the Israeli ground invasion of the eastern part of Khan Yunus, the civil defense and medical teams have recovered approximately 300 bodies of martyrs, many of them decomposed, end quote. Uh, Rescue teams pulled 42 bodies out of the Bani uh, Suhala neighborhood, which is a town on the eastern outskirts of Khan Yunus. 
Um, witnesses said that Israeli forces also destroyed a cemetery in that town, and that's something Israel has done throughout its genocidal campaign in Gaza, is destroying, desecrating cemeteries. Uh, CNN, uh, they let CNN in to Gaza, and they had this big report. Actually, actually, yeah, if I remember correctly, some CNN reporters got into Gaza. They saw a destroyed cemetery. They covered it, and then they looked at satellite images and showed that a total of 16 cemeteries were either damaged or destroyed by Israeli forces. I mean, what is the excuse for destroying and, um, you know, leaving uprooted bodies and um, unearthed bodies, I should say. And uh, they claimed that, you know, at, in at least one of these cemeteries, they claimed there was a Hamas tunnel underneath. So they brought the CNN journalists to the cemetery, but they said they didn't show them anything. They said that they did not provide any evidence, you know, for the claim. And it just raised more questions uh, than answers. If you see this picture, you know, there's all these pictures of of the Palestinians returning to Khan Yunus, just completely a destroyed city. You know, they it was uh, most of it was destroyed after the first Israeli invasion. Then there was a second and then a third. All right. So the next one here, Israeli strike hits Greek Orthodox Church in Gaza. So on Monday, an Israeli strike hit a building on the in the compound of the St. Porphyrius Greek Orthodox Church in Gaza City, marking the second time the church has been struck by Israeli forces since October 7th. According to a Facebook post from the church, three people were wounded in the attack. The church shared pictures that showed damage to a roof and what appeared to be a munition that did not detonate smashed into the floor. What well, looks like an artillery shell um, that was smashed into the floor and did not explode, uh, thankfully. Uh, so the church wrote on Facebook, quote, We thank our Lord, and through the intercession of St. Porphyrius, everyone is fine. We have three moderate injuries. Thank God for everything, end quote. So Foad Ayad, a displaced Christian in the church, told the Anadulu agency that a total of two missiles hit the building. Ayad said, quote, I was inside the church with my child when we heard a loud explosion and saw smoke rising. Israel does not differentiate between mosques and churches in its attacks, end quote. Um, so Khalil Sayeg, a Palestinian Christian uh, from Gaza, who I recently interviewed for this show. So if you haven't seen that, please go check that out. It was about the plight of Christians in Gaza. He has family there. He lost his father and his sister um, in this thing. He said one of the people that was injured in this strike was his aunt. Uh, he said that his aunt was in okay condition, that she only had an injury to the arm. Justin Amash, a former member of the U.S. House of Representatives, so a former congressman, uh, and he has relatives in Gaza, said that he received the call from one of his cousins after the strike. He said, quote, I just received a panicked phone call from a cousin in Gaza. He told me that there has been another IDF strike against St. Porphyrius Orthodox Church. These horrific assaults against civilians in Gaza, including Christians, like members of my family, must end immediately, end quote. Um, Amash lost several relatives when Israel targeted the church back in October 2023. In an attack on October 18th, Israeli strikes killed 18 Palestinian civilians who were sheltering at St. Porphyrius. Um, Christians and Muslims were killed in that strike. And Israel has also targeted the only Catholic church in Gaza, the Holy Family Parish. In December 2023, the church's compound came under siege and two Palestinian Christian women were killed by Israeli sniper fire and seven others were wounded. Um, so, you know, this happened on Monday and I saw... You know, Amash's tweet, uh, Khalil tweeting about it, and I couldn't find too much info about it, so I waited. I figured, you know, th this will come out. Th there'll be some co more coverage of this. But besides the Anadolu, Anadolu agency, which is a Turkish news agency, um, you know, there's no stories in the Western media about this at all that I've seen. Um, the other source that I cited was just was from the National, which I believe is the U is UAE. Uh, funded media outlet, and this was just in one of their updates. You know, you would think a former member of Congress, Justin Amash is running for Senate, by the way, as a Republican. Um, a former member of Congress said his relatives were targeted in a church by Israel. you think that would be a big story, so that's why I thought it was uh, important for me to cover. Um, but, you know, you just really don't hear anything about this.
Again, please check out that interview with Khalil if you have not yet given it a listen or a watch. Um, all right, so the next one here, the U.S. gives the Philippines $500 million in military aid. So on Tuesday, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and Secretary of State Antony Blinken announced $500 million in new military aid for the Philippines while they were in Manila. Their visit comes amid soaring tensions with China in the region. According to a joint statement released by Austin Blinken and their Philippine counterparts, the $500 million is coming from the 2024 Indo-Pacific Security Supplemental Appropriations Act, which was tucked into the $95 billion foreign military aid bill President Biden signed into law in April. So this is interesting. The That $95 billion included $8 billion, which they said was for spending in the Indo-Pacific, about $3 billion. You know, the details weren't exactly clear of what of, of how that was broken down. I know about $3 billion was for submarine spending. Um, $2 billion was foreign military financing. And then a few billion was, was for Taiwan. Um, but here is the Philippines. They're getting a piece of that $95 billion bill. I guess everybody's getting a little piece of it. But just kind of think about what this means. You know, this is an emergency supplemental act that they passed to fund all these wars that, that they think are so important that it requires an emergency um, for the U.S. to fund it. And it includes Ukraine, which is a raging war. Um, and, of course, what's happening in Gaza, which is just a complete slaughter. And then, but also, it includes you know this buildup, this this Cold War style buildup in Asia, to prepare for this future conflict with China. And actually, in in the House, they voted on all of these bills separately, all of the different pieces of the ninety five billion. And the one that received the most support was the Indo Pacific um, supplemental. So I just think it kind of says a lot about the priorities of of the U S. right now. Um, So Blinken said at a press conference that the military aid will help modernize the Filipino Armed Forces and Coast Guard. And this is uh, foreign military financing, which is a State Department program that gives foreign governments money to buy U.S. weapons. The U.S. and the Philippines also announced other steps to boost military ties, including a pledge to conclude a new intelligence sharing agreement by the end of the year and more U.S. investment in military bases in the country. Last year, Washington and Manila signed a deal that gives the U.S. access to four more bases in the Philippines, bringing the total number of U.S. facilities in the country to nine. Uh, Blinken and Austin's visit came after... Right after China and the Philippines agreed to ease tensions in the South China Sea, though they had, you know, around the second Thomas Shoal, that disputed reef where they always have these encounters. Right after that, Blinken shows up in the Philippines handing out military aid. And, um, you know, China and the Philippines are disputing the details of that agreement, which makes it seem like it's not really going to last. Um, but this is the message that the U.S. is sending, you know, right after that deal is signed. Um, and the South China Sea is a potential flashpoint for a war between the U.S. and China because the U.S. has vowed that the U.S.-Philippine Mutual Defense Treaty applies to attacks on Philippine vessels in the South China Sea. Uh, Blinken and Austin repeated that pledge during their visit. Blinken said, quote, We stand by our ironclad defense commitment to the Philippines under the Mutual Defense Treaty, That extends to armed attacks on Filipino armed forces, public vessels, or aircraft, including the Coast Guard, anywhere in the Pacific, including the South China Sea, end quote. Blinken and Austin also met with Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr., and according to the State Department, quote, underscored the United States' ironclad commitments to the Philippines under our mutual defense treaty, end quote. And this came right after the they were in Japan, and they're pushing for this trilateral U.S.-Japan-Philippines alliance. Um, so, you know, everybody's getting some military aid. All right, so the next one here, the U.S. is sending cluster munitions to Ukraine via Germany. This article is from Responsible Statecraft from Mary Wareham. Uh, so this is interesting. So the Convention on Cluster Munitions, the international treaty that bans cluster bombs, um, and they're banned because cluster bombs are basically packed with all these small little submunitions that spread over a large area, so they're indiscriminate in, in nature. And then many of the submunitions don't explode, and civilians find them years or decades later, like what's happened in Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam still happens. 
So they're banned by over 100 countries. Germany is a signatory, but there's there was a recent documentary that revealed the U.S. stores cluster bombs in Germany and they are transferring them to uh, Ukraine from Germany. So that seems like a violation of this treaty and the German government has been very uh, coy uh, when they're asked about these arm transfers saying, you know, oh, we, we can't talk about that or, or whatever. So it's an interesting story. Um, about that uh all right so the last story here the u.s will not comply with uh an investigation into spying on julian assange this article is from kevin gostela at his website the dissenter so the united states government notified a spanish criminal court that it still will not comply with requests from the spanish investigators who are trying to uncover details about an espionage operation that targeted wikileaks founder julian assange as the spanish newspaper al pais reported on july 29th courtney e lee a trial attorney in the u.s justice department's office of international affairs claimed that providing information to spain's national high court would interfere with ongoing U.S. litigation. Assange was the target of an unprecedented political persecution that was globally condemned as a threat to press freedom. The case ended in a plea deal in late June, so he is free back home in Australia. Um, But while prosecuting Assange, the CIA, former CIA director Mike Pompeo, uh, Spanish security company UC Global, and UC Global director David Morales were sued by four Americans who alleged that an espionage operation by UC Global had violated their privacy when the when the contents of their electronic devices were allegedly copied and shared with CIA agents. So the allegation is we know that this company, UC Global, bugged the Ecuadorian embassy where Julian Assange was staying, spied on him, and people who came to visit Assange had to give up their cell phones and, and things were copied um, and given to the, shared with, CIA agents, um, and there is strong evidence that this this company, UC Global, was working on behalf of the CIA of U.S. intelligence, and that's what this case is about. And the U.S. is, of course, refusing to cooperate. Um, and this has been their line; they've kind of re, you know, reiterated that they're not going to cooperate with that case. Um, so that is the news for today. Go check out our viewpoints. One from Tal Steiner. We warned about Seti Timon. The torture there has backing from high up. One from Farah Hassan. The U.S. must stop arming Israel. One from Ramsey Baroud. Watering down genocide. No more moral compromises, please. One from James W. Carden, the prospects for foreign policy in a Harris administration. And one from Nick Terse, only officer convicted for My, My Lai Massacre, dead at 80 years old. Uh, so that is it for the news for today. Um, one thing I want to share again is the Ron Paul Institute event that I will be attending on Saturday, August 31st. Um, it is in Washington at the Hilton Washington Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C., um, it's uh it's going to be a good time i went two years ago and i had a great time and if you like this show you know you're going to want to see ron paul speak daniel mcadams john mearsheimer is going to be there judge napolitano other speakers um the tickets are 85 dollars. totally worth it it's in the hotel you basically just hang out in the hotel for the weekend it's a good time uh i'm going to be speaking at the student conference on the friday the day before um and then I'll be just attending the conference, uh, watching the speakers on the Saturday. Um, so I have the link in the description. Uh, if you want to go, uh, let me know if you're going to attend and, uh, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be a good time. Uh, so that is it. That's everything. Uh, if you want to support this show, tell your friends about antiwar.com, share, like, subscribe, comment, all that stuff. I will be back tomorrow with some more news. Thanks for listening.